Hey, everybody. We're here for another Tales from the Vault. This one is about a serial unaliver in Knoxville, Tennessee, one of the only known ones. In today's episode of Tales from the Vault, I am going to tell you the story of um, Knoxville's only known serial unaliver that happened in the 1990s. And it's kind of creepy, uh, which all uh, serial unalivers are, but this one, it's a little out there. So, let's go ahead and get started into this. I wanted to say that I think I'm going to start making Thursdays my Thursday Tales from the Vault. So, let's get into this. It's kind of lengthy. Thomas Zooman Husky, the serial unaliver who got away with his crime. In the eyes of the law, Knoxville, Tennessee's first known serial unaliver got away with taking the lives of four women. Over several weeks in the summer and early fall of 1992, the unaliver took four women out to a dead-end road called Cahaba Lane in East Knox County in East Tennessee. Thomas D. Husky was born August the 20th, 1960 in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee to Jessica H. and Frank D. Husky. Thomas's dad, began his career at the Knoxville Zoo in 1964, where he became a primary caregiver for the elephants. While details about Thomas's early life are scarce, Thomas's court records indicate that he faced charges of military desertion on November the 9th, 1979. On August the 19th, 1980, Thomas married his fiancee, Sherry Hinn, in Morristown, Tennessee. Initially, the couple lived with his parents in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thomas encountered more legal trouble on August the 27th, 1983, when he was arrested for trespassing. Though details are hard to come by, in 1988, Thomas followed in his father's footsteps by joining the Knoxville Zoo as an elephant keeper. However, this was short-lived after he was terminated after two years due to allegations of animal abuse. The timeline of when Thomas started noticing prostitutes at the corner of Magnolia Avenue and Central Street near the Greyhound bus station and Circle Inn, as well as when he started assaulting them after they entered his car, remains unclear. However, it was known he was a familiar face to the women and had acquired the name Zoo Man, due to his habit of frequently taking prostitutes to a barn near the Knoxville Zoo. In August 1991, a woman listed as D.C., at her initials, was working as a prostitute. According to court records, D.C. entered into Thomas's truck to engage in paid activities. Once inside, Thomas brandished a weapon, threatening to harm her if she made any noise. He then transported her to a barn near Chihuahua Park, close to the Knoxville Zoo, where he proceeded to choke her while forcing her into various acts. Later, he instructed her to lie on the floor while he attempted to strangle her, but was interrupted by headlights from an approaching vehicle. After stripping her naked and doing more threats of violence, Thomas left, locking the barn door behind him. D.C. reported being unable to move her legs for approximately two hours before managing to stand up and unlock the door. While still nude, she was found walking on Magnolia Avenue by a passerby who offered her his coat and drove her back to the Circle Inn. Although D.C. spoke to police, she did not officially file a report until November the 7th, 1992. On February the 27th, 1992, a prostitute identified as GT, initials GT, agreed to enter Thomas's vehicle to engage in paid activity. Thomas drove 
to Cahaba Lane, a dead-end road, and a popular spot for prostitutes. He led GT into the nearby woods. Once there, he confiscated her purse, restrained her hands, and attempted to S.A. her. G.T. resisted, prompting Thomas to resort to S.A. by force. He then abandoned her in the woods, threatening acts of violence if she screamed for help. Eventually freeing herself, G.T. realized her purse was missing money. She sought help at a nearby hair salon, where she reported the incident to the authorities. Upon Police arrival, G.T. recounted the assault and guided officers to the scene. There, they spotted Thomas's vehicle in the vicinity. Shortly thereafter, while investigating the area, an officer witnessed Thomas in the act of forcing another prostitute in the act of S.A. While the victim was naked and on her knees, Thomas was promptly apprehended. However, due to the victim's reluctance to testify, fearing potential repercussions related to her involvement as a, as a prostitute, Thomas was subsequently released. In September 1992, Thomas assaulted another prostitute, identified as initials DL, who had agreed to engage in activities for $50 on Cahaba Lane. According to court records, as Thomas was guiding D.L. to the woods, he was gripping her neck saying, I hate all prostitutes and I'm going to unalive you. Upon reaching a mattress in the wooded area, Thomas instructed D.L. to remove her shirt and he then tied and bound her hands. While restrained, Thomas discovered money hidden in her sock, taking $100 she had earned earlier in the day. In a moment of opportunity, D.L. managed to break free and ran toward Thomas's vehicle where she or he caught up with her. However, she persuaded him they had been spotted by another car and would be apprehended. Thomas instructed her to get dressed and returned her to Magnolia Avenue. Court records indicate she refrained from reporting the assault initially due to apprehension, only coming forward after seeing a photo of Cahaba Lane in a newspaper article. On October the 5th, 1992, Thomas assaulted another prostitute identified as initials A.D., A.D. had agreed to activities for $50 in an area where she was unfamiliar with. Upon arriving at Cahaba Lane, Thomas unexpectedly punched her in the face as she sat in the passenger seat. He forcefully grabbed her by the hair, attempting to drag her in the nearby woods. Realizing the danger of her predicament, A.D. managed to dissuade Thomas from taking her to the secluded mattress area in the woods. Thomas proceeded to S.A., A.D. After the assault, Thomas abandoned her in the woods, leaving her wet and covered in mud. She eventually made her way to where a woman stopped to assist and help flag down a police officer. A.D. officially reported the attack after recognizing Cahaba Lane in the newspaper's photograph. Notably, while being presented with a photo lineup, all victims positively identified Thomas Husky as her assailant. Some women feared Husky because he could be mean. Some stayed away from him for that reason. Others went with him because they needed the money. He had gotten away with his abusive treatment for a while until that fateful day in February 1992 when he went too far. During that time of his arrest in February, he was 31 years old and a father of two. This marked a turning point for the zoo man. Prosecutors theorized. His appetite for prostitutes didn't stop, but he made sure, authorities said, there would be no witnesses against him. On October the 20th, 1992, a hunter found the first body off Cahaba Lane. The victim's name was Patricia Rose Anderson. She had been strangled, bound, and left under an old mattress. She was pregnant. Patty Anderson was born May the 9th, 1961 in London, England, while her father was stationed there while serving in the Air Force. The family later located to Lewisburg, Tennessee at the age of 16. In 1977, Patty became unruly and defiant and ran away from home. She eventually had two children who then resided with their maternal grandparents. As the investigation into Patty's passing progressed, Thomas Husky was arrested on October the 22nd, 1992 for soliciting prostitution. This arrest immediately raised suspicion regarding his involvement in Patty's passing. 
given the charges stemming from the February, not February attacks. Just a few days later, on October the 26th, 1992, during a search for evidence in Patty's case, another decomposing body was found. This time, it was identified as 22-year-old Darlene Smith. Unlike the other victims who were prostitutes and had known criminal charges, Darlene did not. An autopsy determined she had been deceased for approximately two weeks. Darlene was reported last seen on October the 10th, 1992, following an argument with her boyfriend. According to her sister, Shirley, Darlene, a mother of two, was not involved in prostitution, nor did she use drugs. She was known to enjoy socializing and partying, sometimes placing too much trust in strangers. On that same day, investigators found another body on Cahaba Lane. The victim was identified as 31-year-old Patricia Ann Johnson. Patricia had located to Knoxville from Chattanooga just five months before her passing. She was known to be involved in prostitution and was last seen on October the 14th, 1992 at the Volunteers of America shelter. On October the 27th, 1992, while investigators and volunteers from the Knoxville's Volunteer Emergency Rescue Squad searched the wooded area off of Cahaba Lane, they discovered the skeletal remains of a female. The remains had been lying in a wet weather creek for approximately two months. It was later confirmed the remains belonged to 30-year-old Susan East Stone. In 1985, Susan married and coinciding with her involvement with prostitution. Three years later, in 1988, Susan and her husband divorced, with him gaining custody of their two kids. Susan later relocated to Knoxville, Tennessee, as a data control clerk. She was terminated from this position in early 1992 due to, to non-performance. It was revealed by prostitutes Thomas had been assaulting them for three years. An unidentified woman claimed that approximately seven weeks before the women were discovered, Husky had picked her up. Allegedly, he offered her more money than she usually received to take her to Cahaba Lane. Once they arrived, she stated he bound, beat, essayed, and robbed her. She recalled his final words to her as, if you tell the police, I may go to prison, but you will go to the graveyard. Later, during a search of Thomas's trailer home in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, investigators found incriminating evidence, including a rope matching the type used to tie the victim's hands behind their backs, a rhinestone necklace with hair attached to it, an envelope containing red or brown hair, 14 polar rod Polaroid photographs, and 14 explicit magazines. Shortly after, Shuri, Thomas's wife, filed for divorce, relocated, and eventually remarried. Unfortunately, the warrant used to search the property turned out to be a flawed search warrant. Husky was taken into custody. Detectives thought that they had a pretty obvious case against him. It would prove to be anything but that. It was inherently damaged as lawyers were about to find out. After being detained, Husky's first interview with investigators was unremarkable, recalled Davenport, who was then working as the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Investigation Agent. It was after that things turned strange. Husky passed word through the jail in November 1992 that he wanted to talk some more. Davenport said at first, Husky appeared the same as before. The agent had to leave the room for a bit, and when he returned, he was suddenly confronted by someone new, a man calling himself Kyle. This person was demeaning, demanding a bully, Davenport said. Give me a cigarette, and I'll tell you everything you want to know, Husky said. I'm Kyle, and I hate Tommy. Kyle talked about violating, torturing, and unaliving women. He called them experiments. He said he did it to hurt Tom Husky. Husky was mild-mannered. Kyle was coarse. Husky was left-handed. Kyle used his right. I thought it was all an act, said Davenport. Other personalities would emerge. An Englishman, who called himself Dax, and, and an effeminate character named Timothy. He had the voice down pretty good, Davenport said, recalling the moments when Dax spoke. For the men who would defend Husky in court, 
It was a crucial development, evidence that somebody with multiple personalities might have committed a series of horrible crimes. If he were mentally ill, he would avoid conviction for the, for the investigators who believed they'd captured a serial unliver. It was also clear Husky was trying to fake his way out of an unaliving trial. D.A. Nichols said Husky had come up with at least one of the personalities, Dax, while watching the soap opera Days of Our Lives. If you looked closely at a map of where Husky had grown up in East Knoxville, you would notice some street names that looked awfully familiar. Names like Kyle. A grand jury indicted Husky on 23 counts of S.A. robbery and kidnapping. He was held on a $450,000 bond. These charges were related to the women who had managed to escape from the wooded area near Cahaba Lane. The DA, Randy Nichols, chose first to prosecute Husky for the CSA and kidnappings. He secured several convictions in 1996, ensuring Husky would go to prison. He was sentenced to 22 years in prison for the victim, GT. On May 24, 1996, Thomas was convicted for the kidnapping, robbery, and SA of DC, DL, and AD. He was sentenced to 44 years. After three years of legal wrangling, Husky's unaliving trial finally began in early 1999. Because of years of publicity, the jury was picked in Davidson County, Tennessee, and were bused to Knox County to hear the evidence. Courts had thrown out crucial evidence that tied Husky to the case due to the flawed search warrant. The trial was a bit of a spectacle. Crowds packed Judge Richard Baumgartner's courtroom every day. D.A. Randy Nichols, who once had presided as a judge in the same division courtroom, squared off against Herb Monsier, a respected veteran, and Greg Isaacs, a rising star in the East Tennessee legal community. Each side had their mental health experts, all while Husky sat placidly in his chair at the defense table saying very little. The most noticeable change over the years was he had gained quite a bit of weight in jail. Jurors heard testimony about the slain victims. They heard dueling mental health experts testify about whether Husky really had multiple personalities or was just making it up. Professionals for the defense said they had met Kyle. They testified that Husky's disorder came from trauma he'd suffered as a boy. Monsieur recalled he had never met Kyle in all his years of representing Husky. Isaacs, however, had. During closing arguments, Nichols thundered like a preacher at the jury that it was time they put him away for good so he would never be able to harm any more women. Monsieur, in his closing, stepped onto the witness stand and pretended to be Kyle, reminding jurors that Kyle's confession about the crimes were, wasn't completely accurate. He reminded the jury his client was sick. When it was time to deliberate, the jury simply couldn't come to a conclusion. Most agreed later that the defendant had unalived at least some of the women, but they couldn't come to a consensus on his mental state. By day five of deliberations, the jury was helplessly deadlocked. The trial ended February the 13th, 1999. In deflation, Baumgartner declared a mistrial. All that work, all those days of hearings, and litigation and examinations and no verdict to show for it. Randy Nichols, the now retired district attorney general who prosecuted the case, said he regrets for the victims and their families that he could not secure a conviction. I misjudged it mis tremendously, he said. I never did see what it would turn into and what it ultimately turned out to be. I did not see that. Husky avoided an unaliving conviction in no smart, small part because of legal work of court-appointed defense attorneys Herbert Monsier and Greg Isaacs. I was very pleased for Tom that I was able to obtain relief for him, said Monsier. Back then, Husky's prosecution was among the most expensive in the state's history, well over $200,000. The case was also among the state's most prolonged, lasting from the fall of 1992 until late 2005. After the mistrial, the defense and prosecution, 
prosecution kept fighting in court. Ultimately, an appellate court ruled the authorities had used a flawed warrant to seize items from Husky's parents' trailer. They also found that his confession had been coerced. Without the trailer evidence and Husky's confession, Nichols had little left to prosecute the zoo man. The unaliving charges were dismissed in October 2005. Husky got two of the county's best attorneys appointed to him at no expense. Monsieur said he stays in occasional contact with Husky. Investigators say that they're certain who did it, but they concede the odds are slim the man will ever be held accountable. According to some sources, a criminal by the name of Thomas Husky, a.k.a. Zoo Man, and later verified by eyewitness accounts from Tennessee Network for Animals, stated that Thomas Husky had worked for Doc Anto and was in charge of elephant care in the 1990s, previous to that and at the time of his arrest at the Big Cat Compound in Kodak, Tennessee. During the time of his trial, an inmate of Husky's revealed Husky had read Sybil and said he was going to pretend to be mentally deficient to avoid the an alive sentence. Husky's mother said she had never seen any evidence of any alleged alter personalities. The jury was deadlocked at five jurors believing Husky was guilty and sane. Four opted for not guilty by reason of mental defect, and three couldn't reach a decision. Later, one juror said that she had, if she had heard about his prior convictions for S.A. and attempted unaliving, her opinion would have changed. Out on Cahaba Lane, thousands of cars and tractor trailers whizzed by every day on I-40, oblivious to the fact that a man once essayed and unalived four women just yards away near a giant billboard. Today, Husky, a grandfather, is held at a privately run medium security South Central Correctional Center in Clifton, Tennessee, not far from where Nichols' old hometown of Savannah near the Alabama line. He's serving what amounts to a 64-year sentence for the SA and kidnapping convictions that's set to end in November 2056 if he's not paroled beforehand. Nichols is retired from the DA's office. Most of the investigators are deceased or retired. Baumgartner ended up leaving the, br the bench in disgrace over a drug scandal. Monsieur and Isaacs continue to practice law. That was the tale of Thomas the Zoo Man Husky, who was Knoxville's first known serial unaliver. I've heard, the, I remember when this happened, I was... Uh, that's before I got right before I got married, so that's been uh, thirty-two years ago. That was thirty-two years ago. As far as I know, he's still in, in prison. He's been up a couple times for parole, but he's now, he's not been granted parole. I hope you found this interesting. I'll try next week's is going to be about um, the body farm. That is also located in Knoxville. Very interesting. So I hope you don't forget to like, to subscribe, to hit that notification button, and to share my video. It really, really helps me out. So until the next time, I'll see you on the flip side. Tune in next week. Bye.